Okay. So first, um, exam two happened. The high was a 95. The low was a 22. The average is a 63. Then uh, one of your colleagues in the late class was like, uh, you messed up one of the multiple choice uh, or one of the matching things, and I did. So if you go on to um, WebAdvisor, not WebAdvisor, gosh, uh, Moodle now, there's a whole new column that just says exam three fix. And I just gave everyone in the class three points. So if you were the eight people that were like, he's dumb and this is the only reagent that makes sense, you got three extra points. And if you're one of the 68 people who got that question wrong because the right answer wasn't there, you got your three points back. So everything's three points higher. So now the high is a 98, but this is what I started out with. So that is fixed. So I, I done goofed and I fixed it. Um, yeah, if you ever see a mistake or something, just email me because I can go in and like change the question during the exam to like make it so like no one else is screwed up or I can just like fix the points later on because if I screw up, I always want to like make it right. So um, now with that said, um, first story time. If you're taking the exam and you're like, I wish Wakefield could feel the pain I'm feeling right now. The universe had your back. So I picked up the baby at five and he literally screamed at me the entire 15 minute ride home. So like I get him home, I feed him, I preheat the oven so I can like cook dinner for my wife. She comes home and I always pretend like a 1950s housewife and if dinner's not on the table when she gets home, I get beaten. So I just like, her, I was like, oh no, she's home and dinner's not ready. So I put the baby down and I go to put the delicious DiGiorno pizza because like I'm an adult in the in the oven and there's a pan in there i was like ah so i have an oven mitt on my right hand and i grab the pan but now the pizza's on the stove and there's no place for me to put this hot pan i'm like what am i supposed to do what am i supposed to do and for a brief instant i became super dumb and i was like oh i'll just put it in my unoven mitted left hand so i put this 400 degree cookie sheet in my left hand and for like two seconds, there was no feeling. Then it was just, ah, and me swearing a lot. So then I had to run my hand under cold water. I put the pizza in the oven, forgot about it because I was hanging to my hand and burnt the pizza. So it was just a great evening. So if you were like, I really wish Wakefield could feel some of the pain I'm feeling, the universe had your back. So you can, you can feel like, you know what, 2020 took care of you in that instance. Um, so... Besides that, on a serious note, I guess when I started doing these like online multiple choice exams, in my head, I thought that the test averages were going to be higher than they would be in a normal semester. And this bore itself out last semester in Organic 2. The averages were really high, mainly because I gave up halfway through and was like, eh, you have six hours on your final. I don't care. Just like, whatever, get it done. This semester is a disaster, right? And so because I was anticipating, and then that inflated the grades in organic too. Like they were way, the grades were way higher than they normally are. And so going into this semester, I wanted to give myself an out in case the averages on every exam were like an 80, right? So I set our scale as a 10 point scale. Right, so that meant an A, you had to get 450, a B, you had to get 400, a C, 350, and a D, 300. I, I've been teaching for 10 years. I've never used a 10-point scale ever. I've always used a bigger scale, right? So I had in my back pocket that I could make the scale, the normal scale that I use, make it a little bit bigger at the end of the semester. But I want to tell people that I'm going to do that now so that people that are like on the bubble or that are like, eh, I don't know if I should keep trying because I'm too far away from a C and passing the class or whatever, that I'm going to use a 12-point scale uh, going forward. So from now on, an A, you're going to need 440 points. A B is 380. And where it makes the biggest difference really is a C 
is now 320 points. So that means that if your test average on the four exams is a 55% and then you get 100 on the homework and do every stupid little attendance quiz, but you get a C in the class. So if you're like, eh, how am I doing? I feel like I'm really far away. Basically right now, if you have 120 points as your total in Moodle right now, that is roughly a 55% test average plus the 10 points for the like attendance quizzes. If you just get two more 55s, do every attendance quiz and do all the homework, right? You'll get a C in the class. So on the like 10 point scale, you needed like a 62 and a half test average. And I went through and I counted up how many people were like below that. And it was like 20 people, like roughly. And I think now with the bigger scale, the number of people that aren't on kind of like track to get a C is like eight. Right, so this just is gonna hopefully make it a little bit easier for everyone because the averages are around, looks like they're going to be around what they are in a normal semester. So I wanna let you guys know now that I'm gonna make the scale a little bit bigger because every semester I have one or two people, even when they know this is a 12 point scale on the front end, that after the second exam, they're like, I can't drop because of financial aid reasons, but I'm just not gonna try anymore. And they like just take the big L in the class. They just get an F because they just don't take the third exam or the final, or they don't like put any effort into it. And I've had people that if they just took the third exam in the final, they would pass the class and they just didn't. And I'm like, uh. So I wouldn't let everyone know now that if you're like, uh, I don't know if it's worth me like doing stuff because I need to get like an 80 on the next two exams to get a C. Now you need to get like a 65 on the next two exams to get a C. So it just made it that much easier for you. So that was that was the thing, but I wanted to like talk through it. And then I'll send out an email that's like, here's a new scale. So if you feel like you need to have documentary evidence for the end of the semester, you can be like, you said it was gonna be a 320 was a C right there, give me my C. So you can, you can have that in your back pocket. So don't worry, I'm not gonna screw you at the end of the semester. Sound reasonable, everyone? So I just wanted to make it so everyone kind of knew what was up. So in the early class, they were like, well, you said if you have like a 220, you should kind of like plan on getting, like that's kind of on track to get a C. And they're like, well, what about for a B? And I was just like, take how many points you have subtract that from whatever grade you want, right? And what's left is the 75 points for the homework hasn't been added in, the 200 points for the exams, and there's 15 more points of attendance that haven't been put in. So there's like 290 points left. So like in theory, as long as the grade you want is less than 290 points uh, from where you are, mathematically you can get the grade. Now, if you have like 90 points and a B is exactly 290 points away, it's a big jump to go from like 40s on the exams to hundreds. So, you know, shoot within like reason. But, you know, if you're like 220 points away, right? You take the 80 points or 90 points away from homework and attendance that hopefully you can get most of, right? That means you need 130 points if it was 220. So you need a 65 on the exams to get like a B or whatever. If you have like, I don't know, what is that? 160 points right now. So if you've got like a 70 on the first two exams, you did all four little attendance quizzes, you need like a 65 on the next two exams and to do really well in the homework and the attendance, the remaining attendance to get a B in the class. So hopefully, people are reinvigorated and they're like, oh, I can totally do this. So like I said, it really makes the biggest difference like here. Like if you were, if you had an A, 10 points on the scale doesn't make that big of a difference, 
right? But like at the C level where it's like you get an extra 30 points kind of given to you, makes a much bigger difference. Hokely dokely, everyone. All right. So we left off on doing fun stuff. Oh, and one more thing that I told the early class that I should probably tell you guys. Um, all those alkene reactions that you kind of knew for this exam, they are going to be on this next exam as well. Because we're going to get to a point where we're going to like use the reactions to make stuff. And you only know alkyne and alkene reactions. So when I go through like how you use these reactions to make things, I'm going to be drawing from those alkene reactions that we just were tested on. So like if you took them and then took the exam and then forgot about them, don't do that because you're going to need them again. And someone also asked if the final was going to be cumulative. And my response was life is cumulative. So yes, the final will be cumulative. And the final, again, just checking through things, the final will be done the Friday before Thanksgiving. So when there'll be no Zoom after Thanksgiving. Like you will be officially done with this class, whatever the Friday before Thanksgiving is. And since I know a lot of people are gonna be traveling on that Friday, I'm gonna put the exam up on like Thursday morning. And just be like, find two or three hours. I don't know how long it's gonna be yet, but find two or three hours to take the exam sometime on Thursday or Friday, and then you'll be done. I'll throw the homework grades in, and then we'll be good to go. All right, so we left up on this, right? We have one equivalent, so let's say HCl. All right. Oh man, I thought that was good news, and someone immediately logged off of Zoom, and someone else did. Don't leave, Pete. I, I was good to you. I was nice. Don't leave me, Zoom. Jeez. Thank you, thank you, thank you. One person's like, great news, great news, great news. As other people are like, I'm logging out. I'm done. Oh, man. Good job, late class. There are 27 people on Zoom right now. Good job, late class. If you know someone who has given up, tell them the news and maybe they won't give up and you know maybe they can like pass the class. I would like that a lot. So I am recording. Do you need me to like cut this out? I did. I did record the first part. I will not cut it out of the video. I was going to, but I'll leave it in for the people. I'll cut it out for when I use these in the summer. So here, I have one equivalent. I'm going to add one hydrogen and one chlorine. Right? And I'll make the vinyl halide. With two equivalents, I react with both pi bonds. And I make a geminal dihalide. Right. So In a general sense, like if we were to just look at a general rule here, um, alkynes are less reactive than alkenes. Right? I'll write that down here in a second. But if we have an alkyne, right, and we have our first equivalent of HX, we make the vinyl halide. And then the second equivalent of HX makes the geminal dihalide. So like I said, um, alkynes 
are less reactive than alkenes. Okay, an alkyne, a triple bond is stronger than a double bond. That makes sense, right? I've got an extra bond holding those two things together, right? But how come we're able to stop at the vinyl halide when we do this reaction, right? So if the thing I make is more reactive than my starting material, the thing that I make will react before the starting material does, right? So in actuality, the vinyl halide The vinyl halide that I make is less reactive than the alkynes, right? And that's because the X group uh, removes electrons via induction. So basically, what happens is, is you've got this halide on your double bond, and induction means that just because the halide is electronegative, it pulls electrons towards itself through its um, single bond. So it's pulling electrons towards itself away from the pi bond, right? So it's removing electrons from the double bond, right? The whole way that double bonds react right now that we know about is that they use their electrons to go add to something, right? So if I have a group on my double bond removing electrons from that double bond, it has less electrons, so it's less able to go give those electrons to something else, right? Because it has another group pulling electrons away from it. So the halide that is on here pulls electrons away from the double bond, makes sure the double bond is not as reactive. So that allows the first equivalent of HX to react with the alkyne and turn all of the alkyne into vinyl halide. And then once that alkyne that's more reactive is gone, then we start reacting with the double bond to make the geminal dihalide. So if we were just making a double bond without a halide on it, we would have that double bond react as soon as we make it. But because we're putting a halide on it, we get a chance to stop at just adding the halide and not reacting with the other double bond. Another thing, this is a slightly different order. Another thing is we always want to, if we use an internal alkyne, we want to use a symmetrical internal alkyne, as that's the only way we're ever going to get one product, right? So if you look at this alkyne, I'm going to add one of it say HBr. All right. My alkyne needs to be symmetrical because. There's nothing to differentiate the blue carbon of this alkyne from the green carbon of this alkyne, right? They're both carbons that are bonded to, that have a triple bond to another carbon, and then have one single bond to another carbon, right? So blue is triple bonded to green and then has a bond to another carbon. Green is triple bonded to blue, has a bond to another carbon. There's nothing to differentiate which side prefers to be positive, which side prefers to be negative, they're the same, right? So if I have an asymmetrical a double bond, right, it doesn't matter if I put my bromine on the blue carbon or if I put my bromine on the green carbon, right? push comes to shove, those are the exact same compound, right? If you have to name it, it has the exact same name. Right? So if I have a symmetrical alkyne, I'm always only going to make one product. OK, 
because it doesn't matter which side I react to. Same thing down here. Of course, I start with green again. No double bond because there's two equivalents. It doesn't matter which side you add to, you make the exact same product. So if you have a double, if you have an alkyne that's not symmetrical, right? So let's say we have and we used one equivalent of the HCl, right? The blue carbon is bonded to isopropyl. The green carbon is bonded to a methyl, but those two carbons are still single bonded to one carbon and triple bonded to each other. So there's nothing to differentiate which side the chlorine adds to because they're the same kind of carbon. So if you have something like this, you're going to get a mixture of Chlorine there and chlorine there. Right. My goal, unless I have a stroke. Uh, is to make sure that if I give you an internal alkyne, to make sure it's symmetrical, so that you always are going to make one product, right? So I'm not going to do something where it's like, which two products do you make on an exam? On the homework, there's some which of these, which two products you make questions, but on an exam, I'm going to make sure that you get one compound as your product. And this will lead us into hydrations of alkynes. Right, so we can take an alkyne and just add water and acid to it. Right, again, it's just the addition of H2O to an alkyne. Right, so this is, you know, if you're thinking about, oh, Hydration of alkenes, this is very similar. The main difference is when you have an alkene, and you add water and sulfuric acid, you make an alcohol. When you have an alkyne, and you add water and sulfuric acid, you make a ketone. So if you think about it, um, when you react with an alkene, there's one pi bond, you react with that one pi bond, right? So there's no pi bonds left in the product. With an alkyne, there's two pi bonds, you react with one of them and the other one stays around. That other pi bond, so let's say this is one we don't react with right here, those electrons kind of end up being those electrons in that double bond. So the fact that there's one pi bond left over, that pi bond goes from being a carbon-carbon double bond to a carbon-oxygen double bond. So you do end up making an alcohol during the mechanism, but that alcohol turns into a ketone. So you've got your alkyne, You add water and sulfuric acid. And you make something called an 
enol. We went like really far out on a limb as chemists when we named this. We're like, yo, it's a double bond. That's an ene, right? And they're like, yeah. It's an alcohol. And they're like, yeah. That's an all, right? Mm -hmm. So we're just going to call it an enol? Cool. Right? So it's a double bond with an alcohol on it. These aren't particularly stable. So they will, they're in equilibrium with their ketone counterpart. Right? These two compounds, the enol and the ketone, are tot tautomers. And tautomers differ by the placement of a double bond. and a hydrogen, right? So the difference between the enol and the ketone, right, is this double bond here basically ends up being that double bond there, right? So the double bond moves, and this hydrogen will make it green. That hydrogen ends up on that carbon. So your double bond moves and your hydrogen moves. And this happens because ketones are more stable than enols, right? A carbon-carbon double bond versus a carbon-oxygen double bond, a carbon-oxygen double bond is more stable. So if your molecule has a chance to trade a carbon-carbon double bond for a carbon-oxygen double bond, it'll make that trade every time. And I'm drawing like two arrows here, right? Right? These are in equilibrium, but the equilibrium far favors the ketone. So like if you have a bottle of a ketone like acetone, it's like 99.99% ketone, 0.01% enol at any one given instant. So you have way, 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 way more ketone than you do uh, enol, but they can go back and forth. So in getting from one tautomer to another uh, is called going from one tautomer to another is called tautomerization. Yes. Or they just tautomerize. They go from one to the other. So in all simple cases that you see in enol, it's not going to hang around. It's going to become um, a ketone or aldehyde. So basically, anytime you see an enol, it's going to become a ketone or an aldehyde. So let's take our little reaction here. So what's the mechanism? First thing is you already know the first step, right? If you have water, and it's react in their sulfuric acid, you need to protonate your water, make H3O plus. Right? So you have H2O, it's gonna react with sulfuric acid. The lone pair on your oxygen is gonna grab a hydrogen and push electrons out of the oxygen. 
and you're going to make H3O plus plus sulfate or hydrogen sulfate. Right, the H3O plus, that's what's going to actually interact with your double bond or your triple bond. So that's what's actually going to do the reaction is your H3O plus. So you're going to take your alkyne, so you have your alkyne and it's going to react with your H3O plus, All right, and we're going to end up making the pi complex, if I did so many different triple plus, right, where you start to break your carbon-carbon pi bond, right? Because you have that hydrogen closely associated with it. And then you're gonna have your water add to one of the two sides and break that pi complex and give you H on one side, O, H, Right, you add water, you add H2O, so you still have that extra hydrogen on your final product, right? So I have, I need to get rid of that extra hydrogen, then another molecule of water can come in and can grab that hydrogen. And gives you the enol plus H3O plus. So I'm going to show you this here, but I don't ever really expect you to keep to draw this in the mechanism, which is what effectively happens when an enol goes from uh, an enol to a ketone or an aldehyde. Is you can think about it as these electrons push down to make a carbon oxygen double bond. This pi bond comes out, grabs that hydrogen. So that's going to give you your ketone. Right, so this hydrogen here ends up moving over here. And we move where the double bond is. And that will give us our product. So we have the same problem that we would have with adding HBr or HCl to an internal alkyne, which is if I don't, if it's not symmetrical, I'm going to make two different products. And again, we'll go to my stock non-symmetrical double bond or triple bond. Right? If I have blue carbon and green carbon. Right. If I react with the blue carbon, I get the ketone beside the isopropyl. If I react with the green carbon, I get the ketone by the methyl group. Right. Again, I'm going to try to default to make sure that I only give you symmetrical alkynes. Or symmetrical internal alkynes, so that you only ever make one product. Now, like we saw with adding HX, right? If I have a terminal alkyne and I add, say, one equivalent of HBr. The bromine goes on the more substituted of the two carbons, right? The bromine ends up on the inside carbon, and the hydrogen ends up on the terminal carbon. 
Right? If you think about the pi complex that you make, It's very similar to like the bromonium ion. The carbon that is more substituted can better support being positive than the carbon that is less substituted. So I got a big old partial positive on the carbon that is inside on the terminal alkyne. And I get a little bitty, itty bitty baby positive charge on the terminal carbon. And if you're the nucleophile, you want to add to the most positive thing possible. Okay, so you add on the inside. Same thing works for hydration. If you have a terminal alkyne and you do a hydration, you always make a ketone. You don't make an aldehyde. So if we have this, add water and sulfuric acid, there's a problem. Terminal alkynes are not reactive enough to react with water sulfuric acid, so you get no reaction. So if you want to turn an alkyne into a, ke a terminal alkyne into a ketone, you have to add an extra reagent. We have to have water, mercury sulfate, and sulfuric acid. Oops. And that will give you the methyl ketone. Sorry, HGSO4. So it's HGSO4. So mercury sulfate. Now, we've used mercury before, right? We use mercury for the oxymercuration of uh, alkenes. So we have a sense of how this should work, right? Now, the mechanism I end up drawing for this never actually uses the sulfuric acid. Uh, it's just there to make H3O plus. So I'm not going to draw it out. But you have your alkyne, and you have your mercury sulfate, right? And your alkyne adds to the mercury, and then the mercury does what it did for alkenes, which is it uses one of its lone pairs and adds back to the carbon of the alkyne. And you make a three-membered ring that has your mercury on it, just like you did with uh, oxymercuration. I'm going to fit this in there. And then we're able to add water to that three-membered ring to give you O3. To give you your oxygen on there with your mercury still. I have an extra hydrogen on my oxygen. So just like we did with the other hydration, I need to have another water molecule come by and grab that hydrogen. I just looked at the chat and yes, not the DiGiorno. It wasn't, I should have got delivery, man. I wouldn't have had to like bandage up my hand. I was like, I'm gonna save money like a sucker. Like, my wife's a doctor. I should just order pizza. Whatever. Marry up, gentlemen. So you two can say, my wife's a doctor. I'll just order a pizza. So we're going to grab that hydrogen, push electrons over, 
going to make this HGS3, and we make H3O+. plus. So now we have our enol that has a big poisonous ball of mercury on the end. Boom. Right, so we've got to get rid of that mercury. So I'm going to redraw this. I'll give everyone a second here, but I'm going to redraw this last structure on the next page so we actually can see what's going on. Right, this will tautomerize. We'll go from the ketone, sorry, we'll go from the enol to the ketone. Right, still have our mercury. But here's basically where the sulfuric acid comes in. It's just there to make sure everything's acidic and that we have a bunch of H3O plus. Right, we made some in the last step, but the, the sulfuric acid is just making sure we have a bunch of H3O plus chilling around. What that lets us do is protonate our ketone uh, right, have the the um, ketone pick up a proton from H3O plus. All right, so now I have this protonated ketone, and then I can break my oxygen mercury bond. So what happens is the electrons in the mercury oxygen bond will fall down to push electrons back up onto the oxygen. So what this will do is this will regenerate the enol, but it makes it so there's no more mercury attached to the compound. So now I just have mercury sulfate just chilling out. Then I can tautomerize that. And get the ketone. Let me move this so you can so it doesn't look like they're all part of something. Something. Then I can tautomerize this. Who is? He'll be happy with how he draws it here in a second. I swear. There you go. And you'll make your ketone. Right. So you're able to eliminate the mercury by protonating the carbonyl and having the mercury be eliminated or break the carbon mercury bond to regenerate the enol. Now, when you do this, you always make a ketone, right? You never make the aldehyde. So it doesn't matter what your terminal alkyne looks like, right? So if I got my terminal alkyne here, water, it doesn't matter what's going on. You're always just, always, always, always just going to make that methyl ketone, a ketone with a methyl group on one side, every time. One more quick story. So I taught Gen Chem like 10 years ago, right? And you know the Gen Chem lab, you guys probably did it in, in our Gen Chem, where you take mer uh, copper sulfate, it's like hexahydrate or dihydrate, it's like a teal turquoisey color, and you heat the crap out of it with a Bunsen burner, and you drive off all the water and you make like a, it's a, it becomes a brown solid and you like can weigh them and be like, oh, how much water was on there? Cause I drove off all the water. So we were doing this lab back where I used to teach. This guy takes his Bunsen burner and heats the crucible. Remember the little white like bowl dish things? Heats his crucible to it is literally red hot, literally, right? Really heats the thing up good. Takes the Bunsen burner away. And then immediately, like two seconds later, reaches up to grab it so he can tip it towards himself so he can look at it. And I go, no, no, stop. Oh, God, no. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And I was like, it was literally like a thousand degrees a second ago. What are you doing? And I was like, how have you survived the kitchen? Right? Like. Like you take a cookie sheet out of the oven and you're like, oh, I guess it's cold now. It's not in the oven. 
I became that person on Monday. It's the worst. So I almost watched the guy, like, burn the skin off of his hand to, like, the bone or something, right? I could have just sat back and been like, we'll never do that again. Right? Then there would be a lot of paperwork. Why does he have no fingers? Because I watched it happen. Would not have been a good thing to put on the thing. And then, another story. my dad makes teeth. Like, not like a creepy, like, you know, murderer way. But, like, makes, like, crowns and bridges, or at least used to. And so... He had, you have these rings that you have to heat up really hot to like melt gold into them. And then you like put them in these ovens that are like a thousand degrees to like cure porcelain and to like set the metals and whatnot. And so he had one of these rings in the oven and he dropped it. And it was rolling along the table. And he went up to the edge of the table and put his hands underneath it to catch this thousand degree ring. And like right as it got to the edge, he went like, oh wait, no, this is really hot. And did one of these. It was like, whoop. And it fell down onto the floor. And I was like, he was like, yeah, I realized it was really hot. I was like, yeah, like if it would burn through your hand, yeah, you probably have been like, oh, yeah, this is a horrific idea. So I sadly did not have the thought to be like, this thing that is in my oven mitted hand is still really effing hot. I should probably not put it in my other hand. I was just like, got to get the pizza in so the wife doesn't beat me. Uh, she doesn't actually beat me. She hates when I make those jokes, but I do it still, but whatever. I think she could take me in a fight, like push comes to shove.